All right, we are now live, so that's always fun. <laughs> We've got a very exciting chapter tonight, at least it is for me, because I enjoy this kind of crazy stuff. Um, we're gonna be talking about chapter four. Uh, chapter four is gonna be divided up into two halves this week and, then, and next week. Uh, I'd just like to make a, a comment quick for people who might be tuning in to the YouTube presentations after this class is concluded. A lot of people take our, uh, go through our videos a month, two months, six months down the road. Uh, it's pretty important that you check out chapters one, two, and three, our first three presentations, because I have preliminary material that I share uh, that's very important leading up to chapter four. Uh, you'll be a little bit more lost in chapter four if you don't get those preliminaries. So I'm curious, uh, just from the group that we can see on screen now, um, just by waving your hand, how, how many are, are tracking the Kessler stuff that we're sharing? Yeah, a few of you, okay, and I know some people, yep, a, a few have had trouble getting in and we've tried to respond there and sometimes the AWRL tech support is, is the ultimate solution there. So I'm happy that uh, probably half of us are doing that. Um, and then, um, what else did I want to ask about? Oh, uh, did anybody look at the video from the prior chapter four presentation? Just just wave if you, okay, yep, got a couple there. And uh, hopefully that will help you get a head start now because every time you hear something, that's another path through the forest, so to speak. Um, the, you, you plant the seed and then every, every time you go back, um, the, the path, the, the, the brain traces get, get strengthened. So that, that's helpful for those that did it for this week and certainly for next week as well. Very good, it'll be good to have the, your extra class reference sheet handy tonight, we'll be looking at that. And I'd like to start out by uh, just uh, reviewing two slides that we shared last week, learning strategies that work. Um, we talked through all of this, but the spaced repetition using the ARRL tool, uh, highly recommended uh, because Otherwise, this uh, forgetting curve is, is going to get you. So please be doing the chapter reviews there. And uh, using the ARRL uh, tool, that's, that's a self-testing thing that you can do. And no, nobody knows your scores. <laughs> so, and uh, I encourage people to either write down the ones that they get wrong or flag them if you're using the extra Q&A book. And of course, except that permanent learning takes time, you have to keep reviewing this stuff to get it, get it locked in. And as we showed last week, uh, this is what we're building toward, a solid mastery of as much of the material as, as we can. Uh, full mastery would be impossible without probably years of college, but at least uh, the stuff that we cover for passing the test, we want that and not this. This happens, this is what you'll wind up with if you only are exposed to the information one time or use the cramming technique. All right, moving on, there's three sections in chapter four. Radio mathematics, there's no pool questions. Um, of course, if you listen to the Kessler stuff, and the reason we recommend Kessler is he provides different points of view, and a lot of times um, it, it's really heavy. I mean, it's, it's, it'll, some, for, for a lot of us, it, he's over our head. But uh, it, it's just worth being exposed to some of these things from another point of view. And the engineer definitely comes out. Then uh, four two, also no pool questions. And then four three, there's 71 pool questions, which is a bunch. And we'll be covering about half of those this evening. And we don't follow the order that's in the book. Um, so just kind of stay with us here in, in the presentation. So, starting off with radio mathematics. Because we can't really see what's happening with some of the things that are going on, um, that, that's why there are so many equations that show up, especially in this chapter, to tell what the electrical uh, responses are to what's being applied to them. Um, you can really only understand that with, with a little bit of math. And graphs you can think of as pictures of equations. We'll be seeing some graphs tonight. And in this, uh, tonight we're gonna see two kinds of graphs that show the same thing, sa same data in different ways. I'll be sharing a hiking analogy that might, be, might help show uh, what, what that's all about. Speaking of which, let's go hiking. 
So here we've got somebody that wants to go hiking, looking at a map, see where he wants to go, and there's two, two tools. This um, is called a pedometer. It will count your steps. A lot of people have uh, an application like that on, on their smartphone or their, their smartwatch. And here we have a compass. So the first one I want to show is the rectangular concept. We're going to be talking about rectangular and polar in this chapter. But this concept is that you start out from an origin and you walk. In this case, I put down 400 steps this way and then 300 steps this way to get to your destination. So if you're using a compass, you'd be shooting in this direction. And then after 400 steps, take a 90 degree and go that far. And then you will have, you're this far away from your destination. So that's one concept. The next concept is what we'll call polar as it relates to our chapter. And in this concept, we're going to strike a compass bearing that's 37 degrees. That's this bearing here and walk 500 steps. That'll get us to exactly the same point as we did here. And the way it's going to relate to our chapter, we're going to be talking about rectangular uh, forms and polar forms or values. And it's no more complicated than what I just showed you here. You'll notice from the right triangles and the angles, uh, this, this is um, fellow ground for, for trigonometry, but <laughs> we're, we're going to help you not need to do that. You're welcome. <laughs> so a little bit more on rectangular coordinates. So a graph is composed of two axes, a horizontal and a vertical. Here's the horizontal, here's the vertical, called the x and y axes. The point zero, zero is right in the middle. And then a data point is defined as an x-y pair. So in this case, we're going to, let's define this point here. We go over one, two, three spaces, and we're going to go up four. So three comma four represents this point on the map. If we go below the line, then we've got a negative value here. Negative, or three, three over and three down. So the, the clue here, it kind of looks rectangular. Um, this is from those that remember, this is called Cartesian coordinates from your high school math. We demoed the points. And as we go along, uh, I'm going to continue to use blue text. There's a, a lot of information here that will help uh, connect us to uh, the, the test questions, but along with some context and, and background to help hopefully tie that all together. So how are, we, how are we going to remember X and Y? Because there, are, there is a pool question that asks about the X axis, the Y axis. Well, think of X as um, having two feet. It, it stands on the line. The picture of that right here. So you can kind of see the two feet and it needs to stand, stand on something so it doesn't fall over. The Y axis, um, I think of the Y axis as, as having a fence post that, that kind of it lines up with the, with the Y axis. That, that's what holds it up. It's attached here. So if that helps you remember X versus Y, very good. Now, we're going to talk about some number systems. In, in this section, there will be some very strange stuff if you've not been exposed to it before. Uh, real numbers are familiar to us. They're numbers like 1, 2, 3, 7, pi. Um, they're, they're numbers that we, we work with all the time. So we understand that. Now, this is a really weird concept. The square root of a negative 1 is defined as an imaginary number. Now, imaginary in the sense because no two negative numbers multiplied by themselves, or you, you can't take the square root of a number and come up, come up with a negative here. So why in the world do we need to even think about such crazy things? Well, real numbers, the real number system, don't adequately describe ev everything in nature. And um, this complex number uh, system 
It fits very, very well in electronics, as, as we'll see as we continue forward. Now on our calculator, we have an I key. Remember the uh, pi key? It's a triple tap key. It goes pi, and then E, and then I. Um, now, I is what mathematicians use. That's what's on our calculator. Electrical engineers use J for the concept of entering a, um, a complex number, because I is used to indicate current. So I and J, as they appear in our materials in this evening, really mean the same thing. There's a real and an imaginary part, just terms of the complex number environment. And it's very well suited to describing complex impedance in electronics. We'll be working with that. And uh, that concept is that the uh, real part of the number is resistance. The imaginary part is reactance. So we have a real part and an imaginary part, resistance and reactance. This won't all connect yet, but we're planting some seeds. Now the notation, we're talking about rectangular form. Remember our hiking analogy. So it's always in this order. It's real plus imaginary. And the application for us is resistance is the real part, and reactance is the imaginary part. Now, reactance is in no way imaginary. Okay? It's, a, it's a very real thing, but we're, we're speaking in, in the terms of, uh, of the complex number system here. So imaginary parts um, is signified with the leading J, which on the calculator is the I. And then, um, so here's an example. So a combination of a 10 ohm resistor and 25 ohms of inductive reactance may be written as a complex number in this form, 10 plus J, or it'll be I on our calculator, 10 plus J25. For capacitive reactance, the value is written as uh, with negative imaginary, so that would be 10 minus J25. Another concept here that we're going to use is that capacitive reactants and inductive reactants will cancel each other. If one is larger than the other, then the larger one will be reduced by the amount of the smaller one to come up with an equivalent circuit. So from our extra class reference sheet, if you've got your hand, yours handy, if you care to, you can put some notes on it. A couple of concepts here. We're going to talk about time constants in a little bit. But for now, reactants. This is the formula for reactants. It would be good to memorize this. I'm going to have a handout that I send out before next week that has all of the important formulas uh, listed, uh, or the name of them. So I'll, I'll, on one side, I'll say, what is the formula for x sub c? And then on the right, there will be a blank. So I'll have uh, four, five, six of these. And your task is to try to fill in the formula within about 30 seconds, in other words, from memory. So be, be kind of thinking in that direction. And this is one that's good to memorize. Capacitive reactants, 1 over 2 pi frequency C. X sub L, a little different, 2 pi frequency L. This is an inverse relationship. We talked about uh, inverse and direct. And this is a direct relationship here. Also added the words negative and positive. That has to do with whether or not it is above the line in a, in a coordinate system or below the line, or if it's a, a negative phase angle, excuse me, or a positive phase angle. So if you can associate capacitive reactants with the word negative, it's going to help you. And one way that some people think of this, it's the one over. If you think of this line between the numerator and the denominator is a big minus sign, maybe that'll help you connect uh, to the negative concept, remembering which one is which. So here it is pictorially. We've got the y-axis, that's reactance. We've got the x-axis, that's resistance. So that's how it lays out in the way that we're going to apply it. All 
right? Uh, there's another thing that I'd like you to notice, because there's a four pool questions that will, this may help you with. Is there any such thing as negative resistance, is my question. And the answer is no, there isn't. Uh, resistance is neg never negative. So any time uh, a pull question offers to have us plot a point to the left of the y-axis, you'll know that those aren't real answers. So it, it'll help you uh, narrow the, the possibilities down. There's never any negative resistance. There can be positive reactants in the, the, the way that we're using the term. Positive reactants will be for inductive reactants. Negative will be for capacitive reactants. So we're combining real plus imaginary. So here's an example. So this would be three ohms of resistance four ohms of inductive reactants because it's positive, corresponding to this point. And then the other example is 3 minus J3. So that would be 3 ohms of resistance and 3 ohms of uh, negative uh, or capacitive reactants. Never any points to the left because we don't have negative resistance. Throughout this presentation, uh, when we're talking about inductive and capacitive reactants, uh, we're always going to be talking about uh, ideal components. Uh, as you know, coils are going to have some resistance. There's going to be resistance in the leads of a capacitor, but we're only going to be concerned about the inductive and the capacitive properties. So we're, we're going to ignore uh, those parasitic uh, resistances. Questions have come up in the past, so I wanted to mention that. Okay, complex impedance in rectangular form. Oh, for the first time, we've got a little blue text here. A point graphed directly on the x-axis represents a pure resistance. If there's nothing uh, positive or negative um, off, uh, on the y-axis, then the point is directly on the x, and it's a pure resistance. That means there's no capacitive or inductive reactants or they're equal amounts and they've canceled each other out. Now there's lots of pool questions on complex and, and polar, so that, that's why we're covering it here in, in sometimes painful detail, but hopefully that'll help you absorb it. A point graphed directly on the axis, y-axis represents pure capacitance or inductive reactance, no resistance. There's not a pool question, not a pool question related to that. Capacitive reactants will be shown with a negative value. There is a pool question that asks, uh, that gives us negative Jx and asks us what, what that means. Fifty minus J25 represents fifty ohms of resistance in series with twenty-five ohms capacitive reactants. When we talk about um, elements tonight, reactants and resistance, um, we're always going to be assuming a series circuit. Uh, obviously these can be combined in other, other ways, but for our purposes in Chapter 4, we'll only be considering series uh, components. Now you may recall from the past that when we combine reactants and resistance, we get what's called impedance. So impedance is a combination of resistance and reactants. And again, recall that uh, reactance is the opposition to the flow of AC current, and resistance is also the opposition of flow to either AC or DC. So they're both uh, measured in ohms, and there's some uh, tricks when they're combined. Anytime that you see a, a term like negative JX or something like it, be aware that we're always talking about the rectangular form. There's a question that um, asks you to identify a coordinate system. So be aware that rectangular coordinates are used to display the resistive, inductive, and or capacitive reactants components of impedance. That can also be done in the in polar coordinates, which we haven't talked about yet, but uh, the, the pool question that 
only gives us this answer, so we don't have an opportunity for confusion. Now let's talk about polar coordinates. The way that I, uh, this helps me remember it, if I look down on the world, polar, got all of these uh, lines going out from, from the North Pole. Okay, now let's consider some, some facts about polar coordinates. So a complex number may, be also, may also be represented in polar. That was like the hiking analogy that we showed you. In this case, we have a magnitude and a phase angle, only in the polar, polar coordinate system. So in this case, we've got a line that's five units long. That's the magnitude. And then the phase angle is counting from zero, coming around to 53 degrees in this case. So we have a magnitude and a phase angle. This point can also be expressed in polar court or in uh, rectangular coordinates as we saw earlier. A bunch of terms here, and they all show up in pool questions and they all kind of mean the same thing, but I need to expose them to you so you won't uh, miss them, won't get confused. Uh, Something that has magnitude and phase angle is also called a vector or phaser. This could also be called a phaser diagram. Now the uh, engineering um, purists would, would know <laughs> that there are some minor differences between these things, but um, for the purpose of what we're talking about tonight, it, it's all the same thing. And the pool questions will uh, it, it, these terms will all appear. So if an exam question men mentions a phase or angle in relation to impedance, this is referring to the polar form. Angles and polar always go together. Impedance is described by phase, angle, and magnitude. That's one way of showing it. Uh, in, in polar form. So another way to say that would be in polar form, impedance is described by phase angle and magnitude. In inductive reactants, we'll have a positive phase angle. So that's going to be something above, above the horizontal axis. Capacitive, we'll have a negative phase angle and appear below the horizontal axis. And here is, is the, the other word that they will throw in there. A phasor diagram is used to show the phase relationship between impedances at a given frequency. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you, you may recall that the formula for inductive reactants, for example, is um, it's equal to 2 pi frequency L. So frequency is in the formula for calculating the, uh, the impedance or the reactants in that case. A vector, here we're seeing the pool question in a, in a different uh, wording. A vector, or phaser, is a quantity with both magnitude and angular component. Again, these are all things that describe what's going on in the polar form. And all kinds of pool questions relate to this. But once you understand the basic concept, you're not going to be tripped by any of it, I'm sure. And a vector, indicates magnitude and direction, as does a phaser. Now converting from rectangular to polar, and there are some questions that require us to do that. I'll have a much easier way than what I'll comment on here. A data point forms a right triangle. And we see this right triangle here. In traditional conversions, we'll use trigonometry. There's a whole page in our book, 4-3. Um, I just uh, mention it to uh, let you know that it's there. You won't need anything on that page. And the nice thing about uh, our calculator, it lets us do the conversions directly. And there are some cases where we're, we're going to need to convert a rectangular form to polar. And you may recall that in the polar form, you get an angle. That angle is also called a phase angle for Im impedance because our calculator will do rectangular to polar directly, anything we put into our calculator in a rectangular form, it's going to display in polar form. Uh, that's why we can get, we can bypass all, all of this stuff. 
don't need to do the trig. So the TI-36X Pro is our friend. And I'd like to prove that to you now, if I may. What we want to do is convert, and I, I know you don't understand everything there is to know about this yet, but we want to convert 3 plus J4. And what was that? 3 ohms of resistance, 4 ohms of inductive reactance to polar form. And if we do that correctly, we should wind up with a magnitude of 5 in an angle of 53. So I'm going to come over to the calculator cam, turn it on, and follow along with me, if you would, on your calculator. And I'll show you how to do this kind of an entry. The way that we do it, 3, then plus, and then the J4 on the calculator, it's going to be an I. Remember, we talked about the multi-tap key, pi key. Press it once, we get a pi. Twice, we get E. Third time, we get an I. So 3 plus I, 4 is what we want. And then if we press the Enter key, we wind up with 5 as the magnitude and the phase angle as, as 53 degrees. So that was... Uh, that was pretty easy. I hope you'll agree. <laughs> there will be several cases where we need to put values into the calculator in a rectangular form, and then to get the phase angle of the impedance, it'll just come up in the display. That's because of uh, one of the mode settings we set in the calculator. So I hope you're feeling like that wasn't too hard. <laughs> and with all of this stuff that, that does look hard, with the probably five or six pages in the book that walk through that, that you don't need, um, our calculator is our friend. So you've just done your first rectangular to polar conversion with no trig. And all of those fancy words that I just used, you didn't know that you knew that, but now you do. Wow, that didn't take long. Which of the following, some pool questions now, which of the following represents capacitive reactants in rectangular notation. So anybody can unmute. And alpha. 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 Right? Capacitive is going to be negative, and the JX uh, will always be rectangular. Good. How are impedances described in polar coordinates? C Charlie. C Charlie. Charlie. Yep. Magnitude yeah. and phase angle. Which of the following represents an inductive reactance in polar coordinates? Hey, Charlie. Charlie. It'll Charlie. have a positive, positive phase angle. Exactly. What coordinate system is often used to display the resistive, inductive, and or capacitive reactance components of impedance? Delta. It delta. is delta. delta. Yep. Uh, you can also display those in the polar form but they only give us one here, so we're, we're not confused. What is the name of the diagram used to show the phase relationship between impedances at a given frequency? Charlie. 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 Charlie, phasor diagram, correct. What does the impedance 50 minus J25 represent? Baker. Baker. Baker, right, negative. Now, um, I'll remind you again that the order of the answers uh, on the test will not be the same as the order of the answers that, that we're seeing here. So don't, don't get locked into that. Oh, the answer is the first one. No, nope, no, nope, read carefully. Where is the impedance of a pure resistance plotted on rectangular coordinates? Delta. Delta. Right, on the horizontal axis. That represents resistance. What coordinate system is often used to display the phase angle of a circuit containing resistance, inductive, and or capacitive reactants? Delta. Delta. Yep. Delta. Yeah, phase angle is always going to be polar. When using rectangular coordinates to graph the impedance of a circuit, what do the axes represent? A alpha. Alpha. Okay, let's think through that. It, that's correct. X-axis represents the resistive component. Y-axis represents reactive. And again, your answers will not be in this order. 
All right, that wasn't hard, was it? <laughs> we cruised right through that. All right, electrical and magnetic fields. We're gonna talk about some components now. So we've been talking about inductive and capacitive reactants. Let's uh, go another step deeper. Capacitors store energy in an electrostatic field. And capacitor uh, looks like this pictorial or uh, schematically. And if you put an ohmmeter across a capacitor, you'd get an open circuit because the two, two plates exist there, but there's a gap between them or an insulating material. Inductors or coils store energy in a magnetic field. So when we uh, apply current to an inductor, it's going to create a magnetic field around that inductor. In both cases, the stored energy, either in the electrostatic field or the electromagnetic field, is potential energy. That means it's sitting there waiting to be released. Another term I'll introduce here, you can uh, think of a capacitor as, as a voltage device. You put a voltage across it and take the voltage away and it, it's gonna stay there. And a, an inductor, will, that magnetic field will only uh, form and exist while current is flowing through it. So you can think of an inductor as a current device. So energy storage, and there's a concept here that I'm gonna introduce. Uh, when we store energy in, in a reactance, inductive or capacitive, we're storing energy, and uh, the component's purpose in life is to give that energy back. We're going to apply energy, it'll store it, and then at certain magic times, it will give it back to the circuit. Electrostatic um, field can be detected as a voltage difference between two points. If we charged the capacitor and then put a, uh, took away the charging voltage, then put a voltmeter across the capacitor, you could detect a voltage still being there. So capacitors store and release electrical energy, and they will tend to resist a change in voltage. Again, the voltage device concept. Now in a magnetic field, this is created by moving electrical charges or current through the inductor or coil they also store and release energy. In this case, they're storing and releasing magnetic energy, and they will resist a change in current movement. So capacitors resist a change in voltage, inductors will resist a change in current. And here we've got some pictures. This is an inductor, an iron core, and it's showing the magnetic field that um, builds up around the inductor while current is flowing. So the amount of current flowing in the inductor determines the strength of the magnetic field. Kind of makes sense. And then a pull question. The direction of the magnetic field oriented about a conductor in relation to the direction of electron flow is a circle around the conductor. Now some of you in past electronics classes or physics classes may have heard of the left-hand rule, the right-hand rule, and all of that crazy stuff. Um, that used to actually be in the pool, but they took it out. They made it easier for us. They're just wanting us to know that, um, that the field will be oriented about the conductor uh, as, as a circle. Voltage applied across a capacitor determines the strength of the electrical field between the plates. That means is if you charge this to 100 volts or 10 volts, um, that's the, um, represents the energy that's going to be stored. Now there's a couple of stories here um, that I, I wanted to share. Um, I think Gary has one too. I'll remind you of it when we get there. But um, in the, when I was a teenager, before I even had my driver's license, there was a furniture store that sold TVs. And when they would take a trade in, um, they'd put it out in their back lot, out, out in an open field, and it would just deteriorate. So because I was interested in electronics, I kind of wanted to snag some of those TV sets and uh, strip them for, for parts. Um, they didn't like that idea so much. My mom had to sign a release that said I was okay to <laughs> go out there and, and, and get a few. So that, that worked out. Uh, and those TV sets had a power transformer in them, 
Uh, it had a high voltage output, and then it had lower voltage for running tube filaments and that sort of thing. And to figure out which windings were which, um, I'd take an ohmmeter and figure out which winding was there. Well, as we saw in this diagram here, the magnetic field is going to build up when we pass a current um, through an inductor. And for the high voltage windings of the transformer, uh, when I would disconnect the ohmmeter, this field would collapse immediately and throw a spark uh, with voltage that was way, way over the nine volt battery in the meter. Kind of uh, knocked, knocked me over a couple of times until I figured out what was going on. I think Gary had a story too of a modulation transformer. Yeah, um, my first overseas assignment for Voice of America was to a transmitting station in Liberia, West Africa. And one of our uh, 250,000 watt GE shortwave transmitters lost a modulation transformer. And um, so we went down uh, in the basement and there we had stored three or four uh, different modulation transformers for the GEs. But uh, the technician says, we don't know which one is the, is the good one. Um, and so I had my trusty Radio Shack volt ohm milliammeter uh, and uh, I just uh, uh, put one uh, lead to ground and the other across the windings. And the one that almost knocked me on my, with the high voltage kickback, the, the relaxation in the field was so strong on, on those large transform, uh, transformers that, uh, yeah, we said, that's the one we want. And <laughs> that's the one we use. The, the one that bit Gary, he, he found the one that was good, yep. And then for capacitors, I also have a story. Um, those of you that um, may have taken electronics classes ages ago, we, we had a little trick that we liked to do. We would charge up an electrolytic capacitor to maybe 150 volts. Then we'd, would, we would take the leads to the capacitor and wind it around the body of, of the capacitor. And of course, there's 150 volts there. And then we would hold it carefully and throw it to one of our classmates. And of course, when they- Here, catch. <laughs> yeah, here, catch. <laughs> So I don't recommend that you do that, but that, that's just some, ab, some illustrations of the stored energy that these components um, will, uh, can, can provide. We're putting energy in, and those components will want to give the energy back when it's needed. So time constant, there's five pages in our book that talk about time constants of all kinds of hairy math. They use natural logarithms, E, um, and just, it's all kinds of stuff. There is one, there are only two pool questions. One is just a fact about time constants and the, one, the other one is a, a calculation, but, uh, and I'll show you how to do it. And uh, there, the, then a shortcut to rem remember the answers as well. So the concept of a time constant, an RC circuit is the time it takes, uh, the concept is the time it takes to charge or discharge a capacitor depends upon the size of the resistor in the capacitor. And the formula is TC time constant equals resistance times capacitance. And that's on our, on our uh, general class reference sheet. The RL circuit, um, we also store energy in, a, in, an, in an inductor due to current. The same basic definition, the time it takes for a current to increase or decrease through the inductor also depends on the size of the resistor and the inductor. So that's the concept. And here's a complicated looking graph. And this is the one and only pool question for all of those five pages in our book. It all boils down to this one question. So a time constant um, is defined as the time it takes, well, let's look at the circuit up here. Here's a circuit. And when the switch is in the charge position, the current is gonna flow through the resistor, charge the capacitor. And if you're measuring voltage across the capacitor, right here, the amount of time that it takes for that capacitor to get up to 63.2% um, or you can think of it as one third, two thirds, it's a little bit easier to remember. Uh, that's defined as one time constant. So a, a larger value capacitor would, would take longer. You can also change the time that it gets up to 63% um, of the supply voltage by changing the value of the resistor. Now, if you flip the switch down to the discharge position, the capacitor is going to discharge through the resistor. When the voltage gets, goes from 100% down to the 36.8% 
uh, level, think of it as about a third, that's a time, one time constant. So that, that's the concept. The only thing that you need to know, know for the pool questions is it takes one time constant to charge to 63.2% or discharge to 36.8. That's all you need to know for those five pages of math in our book. Yikes. Yikes is right. All right, and here's the calculation question. And that is what is the time constant of a circuit having two 220 microfarad capacitors and two one megohm resistors all in parallel. I mentioned the, the examples in this chapter all deal with series. This, this is an exception. So the easiest way to do this is to draw it out and then you simplify the circuit down to just a single, com a single capacitor and a single resistor and then do the calculation. I've got a rough picture of that here. So we've got two 220 microfarad capacitors. And you might remember when we're talking about how values add for capacitors, these uh, are combined. This, this is going to wind up with a value of 440 microfarads down here. So we're simplifying the circuit. Now we've got two one mega ohm resistors in, in parallel. And those are going to simplify to 0.5 mega ohms. So if, if we apply the formula, time constant equals R times C, if we take 400 microfarads, 440, and 0.5 uh, mega ohms, the, 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 the million parts will, will cancel and just winds up being 0.5 times 440 or 220. It takes 220 seconds. So the time constant is the number of seconds uh, it will take to get to the 68 or the two, approximately two-thirds value of uh, voltage as a result of this value of resistance, this value of capacitance. So I, I went through the steps here of, of how we could actually calculate that on our calculator. But 440 times 0.5 you can do in your head. The microfarad and megohm portions cancel. So half of 440 is 220. There's another little trick here. The value of the capacitor, 220, happens to uh, be the, the answer. So you can just look at this one and say, oh yeah, I remember what Dave said about that. Uh, the answer is going to be 220 seconds. So I'm sharing um, the, the, the question, the theory behind the question, uh, how to solve it, and also any memory tricks that, that we can uh, give to you. Just increase your confidence when testing time comes. Questions, all right. Here's our one and only question. What is the term for the time required for the capacitor in an RC circuit to be charged to 63.2% of the applied voltage or to discharge to 36.8% of its internal voltage? Bravo, one time. Bravo. Bravo. Yep. Time. yep. Bravo. That's one. And then this one here, uh, what is the time constant of a circuit having two 220 microfarad capacitors and two one mega ohm resistors all in parallel? D delta. 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 That's a 220. Yep, so you can um, draw that out and do it the hard way and actually calculate it or use my shortcut. In what direction is the magnetic field oriented about a conductor in relation to the direction um, it says, in, well, it says conductor. Delta. Yeah, the answer is delta. 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 I, I just noticed that um, I would have expected this to say inductor, but it, it's true of a conductor as well. A piece of wire does act as a, as a coil. So, but it is in a circle around the conductor. Our phase so angle. All right. So we're, we're going to um, increase the complexity a little bit at this point. Talk about phase angles. Don't anybody get scared. So if you can imagine a circle and time is marching on this way, and this is the, it, it's increasing in voltage, decreasing, going back, going back here. So as, as time goes on, it's going to trace out a sine wave. So time is going in this direction and voltage is going in this direction. So as, as we spin around, 
that's what we are seeing. Now, sine waves we find everywhere. Uh, the splashes, the waves in a pond when you throw a rock, um, uh, radio, of course, every place, resonant circuits, which we're going to get into next week, um, power generation. Uh, we, we see sine waves every place. In this case, we're um, showing one second to complete the full 360 degree revolution. So from A, if that's zero, this would be 90 degrees, 180, 270, and then back to zero. So you can kind of see, um, I'll, I'll make a, a comparison or an equivalence of phase angle to time. So at, at uh, a 90 degree phase angle, if this is one second to go through the whole thing, this would happen at 0.25 seconds. So fa phase angle and time can be related. Now, why does the world seem to revolve around sine waves? Well, here's the, a picture of an AC generator. You can see a coil being rotated through a north and south pole magnet. And as it's doing that, the connections to some slip rings here will trace out our familiar sine wave. So time, again, time differences that occur here as this is turning around can be equated to differences in phase angle. Here's a bit more. As I said, phase angle refers to time. One full cycle is 360 degrees. It's measured between two similar points on each waveform. In this case, we've got two waveforms. And this, you could think, that let's say that we're measuring voltage and current um, through a resistor, or with a resistor. First of all, resistors dissipate energy. If you put 10 volts across a 1 ohm resistor, you're going to get some heat. Voltage and current are in phase, so as the voltage increases, the current will also increase. They'll be exactly in phase. So we're tying it to uh, AC voltages that applied to a component. Now things start getting a little bit freaky when we get into alternating current. We'll be showing that a bit more. Okay, capacitors and inductors store and release energy. Yeah, I'm throwing the capacitor across the classroom or uh, getting knocked on your butt from uh, measuring inductor windings. Okay, store and release energy. Now, unlike in resistors and uh, resistors, voltage and current waveforms do not rise and fall together with inductors and capacitors. I'm going to introduce you to Eli the Iceman. This was also in the reference sheet tutorial. This is just a little phrase that will help you get, oh, maybe half a dozen pool questions right. It sounds totally stupid, but um, it's going to be very helpful. The word the and man have no significance other than help you remember the phrase, but Eli and ice are going to be quite important. Now, we have a characteristic in inductors where when you place a voltage across an inductor, the voltage is there instantly, but as it's charging, um, the current will rise slowly. So the voltage is going to be leading the current. In capacitors, when you apply a voltage to a capacitor, the current starts increasing very rapidly uh, until it gets up to the applied voltage. So in capacitors, current lead the voltage. Now, do we see any cor correlation here to Eli? We'll be looking at that some more. Now, L is the symbol for inductance, measured in henrys. Now, E represents voltage, I represents current. So for an inductor, Eli, the inductor, the voltage, see the E comes before the I. So voltage leads current because E comes before I in our, our little word. Or you can look at this another way. You could say current lags the voltage. If you're referencing it to current, it's going to be lagging. It's behind 
the voltage because that's how it appears in the word. And the pool will be interchanging these. Now I have, um, um, I don't know if it's just me, <laughs> but I have a real hard time remembering this in my head, okay? So when I'm dealing with a uh, question that's asking about phase angles, I always write down the word Eli if it's an, an inductor or ice if, if it's a capacitor. Then I can't possibly, well, usually <laughs> I, can't, I can't get these backwards. So for capacitors, current is going to be leading voltage or voltage is going to be lagging current. So let's, let's keep going here. So C in ice is the symbol for capacitance measured in farads. I is current, E equals voltage. Notice this is just backwards from the inductor. As seen down here, for the capacitor, current leads the voltage. I comes earlier in the word than E. Current leads the voltage, or voltage lags the current. E is lagging the word I in the word ice. There's another interesting characteristic when we say that in phase relationships, um, inductors and capacitors have a very specific amount of lead, lead or lag. If it's a pure inductor or a pure capacitor, that is going to be 90 degrees. So in a coil, the voltage is going to lead the current by 90 degrees. If we combine resistance and inductance, then the phase angle is going to be somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. The same concept over here. There's also a uh, painfully detailed description of what I just said in the reference manual tutorial, that six page document that I gave you a week ago. All right, more voltage and current relationships, capacitors. Capacitors resist changes in voltage. And I, I like these physical examples. Uh, a capacitor is a little bit like an air tank. So when you fill an air tank with air, you apply an air source to it. And in the beginning, the tank is empty. Uh, but the pressure that you're applying to it is whatever, whatever the source pressure is. So uh, that, that tank will fill and, it, and eventually get full. A capacitor works very much the same way. Now let's look a little bit more at uh, voltage and current phase relationships. Remember ice, capacitor, current leads the voltage. So as soon as we apply a, a voltage to a capacitor, the current's going to be fairly high as the capacitor is filling, which is why current leads the voltage. Phase angle is going to be minus 90. You remember why it's 90? Minus 90? Because phase angles, um, uh, capacitive reactants we're always going to consider as being negative in the complex number framework. So the relationship between the AC current through a capacitor and the voltage across a capacitor is that the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees, I, C, E. Now remember I said that um, both an inductor and a capacitor, they store energy to give it back a little bit later. So the electric field strength stored in a capacitor is um, stored and released twice each cycle. So we store and uh, we come down this. So it'll, it'll charge up to a positive value, it'll charge up to a negative value and go back and forth. Max current at zero volts when we first apply uh, the voltage to the capacitor. It'll be working as hard as it can to fill up, just like the air tank. Current leads the voltage. So the idea is it's storing it up and then it will be giving it back. And in inductors, um, the same effect happens. It's just a, a bit backwards. The physical uh, example here is like the flywheel on a car. Now, if, if you've got a car with a four cycle engine, it's got four spark plugs in it. So as that uh, crankshaft turns around in the car, um, it, it's going to be helped by four impulses from the firing cylinders. But the interesting thing is, if you've got a four-cylinder car and you s uh, accelerate smoothly, you don't feel little bumps and little jerks as each spark plug fires. 
that's because there's a flywheel there. It's a great big heavy piece of metal at the back of the engine. You never see it because it's inside the engine. Um, and that is smoothing things out for you. So as you get a, an impulse from one spark plug firing, that will give energy to the flywheel. It will continue to spin until the next spark occurs. That, that smooths, smooths it out for you. And inductors work very much the same way. So this is showing the resistor case where voltages and currents are in phase. We saw before. And then again with an inductor, um, the act of the inductor giving back is the concept of, of induced back EMF. It's called electromotive force or induced voltage, trying to um, hold that current steady. And its value is the greatest when the magnetic field is changing the fact fastest. We, and uh, it uh, generates a polarity that opposes the change in current. These, this is just background information contrasting inductors with capacitors. But that's what knocked me uh, on my uh, tail yeah. with that modulation transformer, exactly. the back EMF. The back EMF got him, yep, and got me too on my TV transformer. All right. A little bit more here now. This is inductors. Eli, voltage leads the current. Phase angle is positive 90 degrees. The relationship between the AC current through an inductor and the voltage across an inductor is that the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees. Eli, voltage leads current. See how Eli and ice just keep coming up over and over and over again? But if the pull question is uh, given in terms of current, then in this case current lags the voltage. And again, I can't keep those straight in my head. I have to write them down. You might be smarter than that. So resistance versus reactance. Um, these are both oppositions. They both represent opposition to the flow of current, AC in particular. Resistance is the opposition to the passage of either DC or AC current. Reactance is the opposition to the AC current flow through the inductor capacitor. It only applies to alternating current at a given frequency. We've got inductive and capacitive reactance. Only comes into play with AC circuits, alternating current. Again, the idea of putting energy into the component and then that component being willing to give it back. So there's some formulas here, and we will need to solve these um, for some of the pool questions. So remember the direct and inverse relationships we talked about? So with inductive reactants, it increases the amount of opposition of the flow of, of AC current. That reactants increases with increasing frequency. So as the frequency goes up, the opposition to AC goes up. Capacitance is just the opposite. It's the inverse relationship. XL, reactance is in ohms. XC, reactance is, is in ohms. Resistance, re uh, resistance is in ohms. So sometimes that's confusing to people. So frequency is always in hertz. L is in, uh, or inductance, measured in Henry's. C, measured in farads. We will need to be able to recognize when we need these and use them. So frequency affects the value of XL and XC. Ah, right into some pool questions. Now, first thing I want to tell you is this will not appear on your <laughs> test booklet, okay? <laughs> I just gave that to you to help you, uh, help remind you of what you have to be thinking when you're answering this question. What is the relationship between the AC current through a capacitor and the voltage across a capacitor? Delta. Delta. It's delta, yep. Ice current leads voltage, and we know with a pure capacitance, um, that's going to be, the, the, the phase angle is going to be 90 degrees, the difference. What is the, and again, Eli won't appear in your test, what is the re relationship between the AC current through an inductor and the voltage across an inductor? Alpha. Alpha. Good. Voltage leads current by 90 degrees. 
complex impedance. Okay, we've talked about pure resistors, or excuse me, pure uh, capacitors, pure inductors. Now we're gonna talk about complex impedance. We're going to add resistance into a series circuit. Impedance, or Z, is composed of two components, resistance and reactance. The reactants, the resulting reactants, can either be inductive or capacitive. And they uh, can be connected in either series or parallel. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're only going to be considering the series case. So if, if the uh, phase angle is going to be 90 degrees, uh, positive for an inductor, negative for a capacitor, the uh, impedance of, um, or the, the phase angle of, of a complex impedance consisting of one of those two components, inductor, capacitor, and the resistor, is going to be somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. That's all this is saying. And the phase angle depends on the relative amounts of resistance and reactance. And the sign of the angle depends on the type of reactive element. Inductors will al always have a positive angle. Capacitors will always have a negative complex impedance angle. Notice this is all black text. So the way that we approach these problems is that if, if there's multiple components in series, our approach will be we're going to uh, combine the resistors to just one. I don't think there's any case where we have to do that. The multiple reactive elements, there might be capacitors and inductors in series. We have to uh, rewrite that into the form of one reactive element. The way we're gonna approach that, we have to determine which value is dominant, capacitance or inductance. So we've got 100 ohms of capacitive reactance and 50 ohms of inductive reactance. The dominant reactance is capacitance. And the way this actually works, if it's 150, we would reduce the 100 by the amount of the inductor, leaving us a net 50 ohms of capacitive reactance. Okay, we already saw that inductors and capacitors have opposite phase angles. Combining capacitors and inductors will result in a smaller total reactance. So in other words, it won't be 90 degrees, it'll be somewhere between zero and 90. And if the capacitor and inductor have equivalent reactive values, they will cancel each other. The phase angle will become zero, resulting in only a resistive element. So here's um, the couple of um, I'll, I'll share a couple of slides where we can actually do this. We want to calculate the impedance in the circuit. Uh, we want to specifically focus on the inductor. So to do that, calculate the resistance of 20 millihenry mill, mill uh, of uh, 20 millihenry inductor at 10 kilohertz. That's what's being applied to it. So the formula is XL equals 2 pi frequency L. And then here's, here's the math that should get us down to uh, about 1256 ohms. I'll jump over to the calculator cam and we'll actually do that. Hopefully that's visible. Yeah, it is. Okay. So here's our circuit. So to calculate the value, the inductive reactance of the inductor, so on the calculator, this is two pi frequency L. So for the calculator, we're gonna have to enter two pi and then the value of frequency, which is 10 kilohertz. So that's 10 EE, 10, 10 to the third, times then the inductor, 20 millihenries. So that's 20 EE, negation key three. So let's see what happens there. I'll turn on the calculator, clear it, and we'll see if we can we can enter this. And feel free to follow along on your calculator. It's gonna be two. And remember where the pi key is up here. It's the triple tap key. The first tap is pi. And then we have to put in the frequency, which is 10 kilohertz. So that's gonna be 10 EE, 
for exponent entry in kilohertz is times 10 to the third. All right, then we have to multiply it times the inductance. Multiply key. The inductance is 20 millihenries, so it's going to be 20 exponent entry EE. -E. And millihenries is uh, to the minus third. So I'm going to put in the negation key and 3. Ian, if I didn't mess this up while I was talking, it comes out to be 400 ohms. No, 405. 400 hmm? ohms. And that's useless, okay? <laughs> so rem remember our answer? It's 400 pi. Um, ah, thank you. Okay, yeah, 400 pi. Yeah, my brain gets wrapped around my tongue sometimes and something bad happens. 400 pi. Okay, and I think we'll agree that's a useless value. So our, our answer toggle key friend is over here. And that's going to give us 1.26 times uh, 10 to the third. You can move this over three places. should give you 1260. Uh, that's also a little clumsy to look at. If we press the answer toggle key one more time, okay, now we've got 1256. So that's a little bit easier to handle. So we use the answer toggle key a couple times to come up with that value. All right. So now what we want to do, that we've managed to figure that part out, is figure out the combined impedance and phase angle of, of this circuit. So we know that, I'm going to clear my calculator. So we know that the resistance is 1K, 1, 1,000 ohms. What we're going to do is enter this into the calculator in rectangular form. I mentioned that earlier, but it was a while ago. You may not remember. So to enter this in a rectangular form, we're going to put in 1,000, okay, plus some kind of a J value. So we know that X, uh, induct X sub L is going to be 1,256. Now, is that going to be positive or negative? It'll be positive. 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 And then we're going to put in the, uh, thank you. I just put in, I put in two pluses. Let me start over. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> one, two, five, six, plus, one plus. <laughs> you guys are too good. All right, yes, 1,000. You don't need me. Plus. Okay, how about this one now? It's going to be, uh, it's inductive reactant, so it's going to be positive, plus I1256. Okay, to get to that, the I, that's a triple cap, tap on the pi key. One, two, three, I. There, you go. there we go. Now I'm with, with, with you all. Um, I1256. And if we're really lucky, we're going to get something that looks a little bit weird. We're looking for 1605. So the angle is coming out right, 51 degrees, 51.5. And it's showing 1.61. So that'd be, if we move the decimal point three places, it would be 1610. If we hit the answer toggle again, there's the 1605. So the impedance magnitude is 1605 ohms. Phase angle, 51 degrees. And because it's an inductor, voltage is leading the current, or current is lagging the voltage. So there's a practical example of working one of those out. Thank you for being on the ball, everybody. Appreciate that. Here it is on the slide. We did that on the, uh, on the prompt card. And we're right into some exam questions. So we try to give you just enough theory to make you tired, <laughs> and then, then we get into the exam questions. OK. Now, I, um, do I actually have this? Well, that's the answer. But what is the phase angle between the voltage across and the current through a series RLC circuit if X sub C is 500 ohms, R is 1 kilo ohm, and X sub L is 250 ohms? So we can go through the process that, that I just showed you. And um, 
I'll, I'll give you a little trick. For all of these questions that ask for phase angle, the answer is always going to work out to 14 degrees. <laughs> I think there's three questions in the pool that are similar to this. and you, you can do the math if you want, but it'll come out to 14 degrees. It might be positive or negative, but they're only um, considering the, uh, the, the number of degrees. But this part you can help me with, okay? So we know that if it's uh, inductive reactants, okay, what do we use, Eli or ice? Well, what is dominant? Well, what is dominant? Oh, it's Charlie. Charlie. Yep. Charlie. 250 ohms. Uh, negative J. Negative. Yep. Right, and I, I think I have this over on, on the, uh, the whiteboard as, as well. <coughs> yes, I, I, I did. So when you get a, a problem like this, what you want to do is to uh, um, decide which, which of these is dominant. And this is, these are different values than what we just looked at. But we see that the uh, inductive reactants is higher than the capacitive reactants. Therefore, we have to reduce the dominant by the smaller, and we wind up with an equivalent circuit of a resistor in series with a 75 ohm reactance, uh, which is inductive. So that, that's the process you need to think through. So voltage lagging the current. Do you agree with that? Yes. Right, that's uh, X of C is uh, greater than X of L. Yes, exactly right. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So here, here it is again uh, with the values in the question. Draw it. Be very helpful. Show the values. Determine which is dominant. Capacitance. Reduce the larger by the smaller. In this case. 500 minus 250, enter in rectangular form, 100 minus, because it's capacitance, minus J or I 250 on the calculator. Press enter. Phase angle will come out to 14 degrees. And then using ice, voltage is lagging the current. And that answers that uh, question. Here's another one. It works the same way. So again, X sub C is dominant. It's 100 ohms. X sub L is 75 ohms. And notice what they're doing uh, with us here. They're, they're doing us a favor. They're giving us in the question the actual value of inductive and capacitive reactants. They're not making us figure out what that value is by giving us a frequency uh, and, and, and a capacitance or inductance value. We're coming mm -hmm. to that. <laughs> we keep layering more stuff on. Alpha. That is alpha. And we approach it the same way. Draw, show the values, find out what's dominant. Enter it in rectangular form. Calculator will display it in polar, giving us 14 degrees. And using e our ice again, we can determine which is leading or which is lagging. Okay, here's another one. This one's a little different because now uh, X sub L is dominant. B bar one. B is the answer. We approach it the same way. We saw the difference in what's, what's dominant. We put in the values. It's Eli, so we're using, or it's an inductor, so we're using Eli to determine uh, if we're leading or lagging. Okay, now we're going to add another layer of complexity. <laughs> and there's, I think, four questions like this in the pool. And we'll walk through how to do at least one of them. Um, and then after doing that, um, I'm going to give you a shortcut <laughs> that will make the math completely unnecessary. But I'd like you to pay attention to it anyway. So at least you know how. You know why the right answer is the right answer. So it's, it's asking us here, which point, here we've got a coordinate system. If, if you want to see this, I guess you can see it in the uh, display. 
but it, this same diagram is on page 4-21, if that would be easier for you to look at. So note what's changed here. Frequencies are given and not reactants. So we've got 38 picofarads and 14 megahertz. So we're going to have to figure out what the capacitive reactance is using the capacitive reactance formula. Bravo. Just, all right, somebody thinks it's bravo. That just happens to be true. And well, you don't even need to figure it out because it's already 400 on the line there. Yep, that's the shortcut. That right, I'm gonna, so you know it's not. That's the shortcut I'm going to be giving you in, in a minute. Uh, if you know, and I'll, I'll share that now since it's come up, we, need, we know that we're dealing with 400 ohms, so we're going to be going 100. We're going to go over to the 400 point. We know that it's capacitive, right? So it's going to be below the line. And guess what? There's only one value that's below the line. That's point number four. This is so, a sharp group. I'm sorry? It, this is a sharp group. We sharp have. group, yes, yes. Or, or they, they, uh, some of them looked at it from, from last year. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, last year. Yeah, all right. So just to walk through it for those who, who didn't get there that quickly. So what is that, what's it asking for? It's asking for which point in order to get that, we need to know what the R and X, C, X sub C values are. So we're going to draw it and show the values, which I've done here. Then we're going to calculate uh, the capacitive reactance, which is 1 over 2 pi frequency C. That will give us a value. We're going to write it in rectangular form. Once we have that, it's going to be 400 minus I-299. And then we'll match it to the uh, coordinate given to us in the uh, diagram, which is 4.4. Yep. So here's another one. This is an inductor, so we know, we're, we know it's going to be above the line. Now, can we apply our shortcut to this one? Um, let's try. So 1, 2, 300. We know it has to be above the line. And there's only one. If you can uh, assume that these two points are right on the line, zero, that, that'll help wash out some of the confusion. But uh, so it's an inductor. It's going to be 300 plus something, which is probably going to be point. It's 300. There's a mistake on that. Glasses, yeah, 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 yeah. B through point three. Yeah, three, 300, 300, right, right, right. So, yeah, one, two, yep, okay. Yep. All right, you're, you're smarter than I am, but that's okay. I don't, In Dave's defense, it's hard to read on these screens. It, it, the it is, print. it is. But again, the shortcut it will work for you if you assume that point 0.8 and point 0.6 are, are right on the line. It'll never be one of those two. It'll never be anything over here because we're dealing with negative resistance, which doesn't exist. So it can't be one of these. Got to be on this side. Of course, we've got a sharp group here. If they could invent negative resistance, they can make a lot of money. Yeah, there, there, is, there are some effects uh, with negative resistance when you get down near absolute zero um, centigrade, but we don't need to get into that. We're active circuits. Yes. So again, this, uh, this, this shows us the process that we go through. And then this is, this is the last one. What do you think the answer to this one is? A alpha? A alpha, point 0.1. Alpha. Because right? we know that it's uh, capacitive, 300 ohms, so it's, it's going to be here and down. Yep. So uh, happily, you won't need to, to uh, do, you, don't, you won't need to actually calculate these. I did want to show you how to do it, though so that you'd have some idea. <laughs> now, uh, the next pool that's coming out, July 1st, I don't know if the pool committee got wise to the fact that they were making it too easy, but they're not all 14 degrees. Uh, they, they've picked some different values. But you guys don't have to worry about that, guys and gals. Okay, this is the process again to work through it. All right, now <laughs> we're going to be talking, well, this would be an awesome place for a break, actually. Let, let's take our five-minute break here. And then I'm going to get into some stuff that's a little bit mind-boggling. It's 
esoteric, complicated stuff that you'll never use in your ham career. But there are four pool questions, so we, we want to give you some hints on how to solve these. Um, so th with that as a preamble, we'll go ahead and take a break, and maybe my brain will recover during the break. Thank you.
Okay, well, welcome back. We're going to talk about an area now that's um, it's a little bit techy, but with the shortcuts that I'll offer. And there's a, a couple of items on our uh, uh, list. Uh, I, I can put it up here on the calculator cam. It's uh, these But if I turn it over, yeah, here we go. Impedance, admittance, reactance, and susceptance. It's, it's these little things here. We don't actually have to calculate any of these things for the exam. They just ask, wants, want us to know some relationships. All right, so here's the four pool questions. Susceptance is the reciprocal of reactance. All right, which means B equals 1 over X in units of Siemens, which uh, again, we don't have to calculate this. We just kind of have to remember that. Um, remember this as a fact. Remember when Gary was going through rules and regulations, <laughs> uh, there sometimes is no rhyme nor reason to why they are what they are. But um, you have to have to know know the answer for the for the exam. The, this is a little bit like a little bit of the same thing. If you were an engineer designing with some of this stuff, there there are some definite um, uses for it. But for us, we just need to know that susceptance is the reciprocal of reactance. Another one, susceptance is the imaginary part of admittance. Now you'll find if you look at our extra class license manual, it's not going to be very helpful <laughs> for any of these. Uh, Gary had something that he shared the last time we did this. Um, I'm trying to remember what it, what it was now. Um, yeah, you got to tell me. I don't remember. You're, yeah, yeah. A susceptance is your imaginary friend. There you go. That, that's what it was. <laughs> susceptance is your imaginary friend. So uh, there's a memory trick. The magnitude of susceptance is the reciprocal of the magnitude of the reactance. Wow, what a, what a bunch of uh, words those are. And I did have a memory trick for this. If you can relate it to emotions, if someone tells you an obvious lie, your reaction is going to be suspicion. So that, that, that might be a, a help here. And then the last one, converting reactants to susceptance. Take the reciprocal of the magnitude and reverse the sign of the phase angle. So. Um, these, the simplest way to get these, and you're never going to use these in your ham radio career unless you get into engineering. Um, so you just need to know them for, for the test. So my advice would be to look these over and um, um, see, see if you can remember them well enough to, uh, to, to place, uh, get it right on, on the exam. We'll review them again as we get into the test questions. Admittance is the reciprocal of impedance. This is how it's uh, shown mathematically. This one, a little bit of a memory trick here. You can think of admittance and impedance uh, with the uh, image of a door. If a door is open, it will admit you. If the door is closed, it will impede you. Also, Y and X are next to each other in the alphabet. So there's a couple of memory tricks there that might be useful to you. And then right into the questions. How is impedance in polar form converted to an equivalent admittance? Baker. It is Baker. Take the reciprocal of the magnitude and change the sign of the angle. So you take one over the value and change, change the sign. Again, just, just look at that one. What happens to the magnitude of a pure reactance when it is converted to susceptance? D delta. Yes, it becomes the reciprocal. Yeah, go, my advice is to go over these five or six times. What is susceptance? C, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie. It's your imaginary friend. What is admittance? 
The alpha. Yep. Alpha. Inverse of impedance. So it admit and impede kind of go together. What letter is commonly used to represent susceptance? Uh, it, it is D. Uh, and be careful not to confuse the letter of the answer with, with the answer. So that, that's, that's an easy way to get tripped on this one. Be sure that you're, don't, don't say B if, if you mean D. <laughs> Now we're moving into an area that's um, a lot less uh, arcane than what we just went through. Reactive power and power factor. Um, there is, this is the last section for tonight, and it's relatively easy. We are definitely past the brutal part of tonight, in this part of the chapter. So let's review a couple things. Power equals voltage times current in a DC circuit. Now. Apparent power is a term that only applies to AC circuits. And the trick, remember we've talked about phase angles, does not take into consider phase angle. Therefore, voltage times current, if you measured it coming right out of an outlet, for example, wouldn't necessarily give you watts. What we would have is something called VA. So if we measure the voltage going into a circuit and the current going into it, that's the volt amps of, of that circuit. Not necessarily the watts, like it could be with DC, because of the reactive components that, that might be in the circuit. Here's a good one for you. Reactive power is wattless, non-productive power. Now, what, uh, when we pass voltage and current through a resistor, we get heat. We, we get watts consumed because the uh, voltage and current are not in phase when we're uh, passing the current through a, a, a series circuit uh, in the inductor and the capacitor, that's what makes it, that's what makes this statement true. Reactive power is wattless, non-productive power. And power companies hate this, by the way, because uh, most loads, especially in uh, industrial complexes, are inductive. So power, um, you, you, you might see huge compensating capacitors in uh, substations to, to cancel out that inductive element. Practical application. Reactive power in an AC circuit that has both ideal inductors and ideal capacitors is repeatedly exchanged between the associated magnetic and electric fields, but is not dissipated. So we're throwing it back and forth, but it, it's not actually doing anything to accomplish any work. So just uh, review, review these two items. And here's a diagram. We've got a, a voltage source. Let's call it 120 volts AC coming out of your outlet. We're measuring the current, AC current. We're measuring the voltage. This would be the, the value would be VA, volt amps. So to get the real power, we have to measure, uh, we have to take the apparent power, the volt amps, and multiply it times something called a power factor. That power factor takes into account the leading or, or lagging um, phase angles in the reactive components. So power factor is the real power that's being consumed by the circuit compared to the apparent power. The, these are just concepts. You won't have to calculate this directly from these formulas. So in the case of an apparent power, 250 volts times two amps, just another case, it, we'd have 500 VA, volts times amps, or VA, that is actually what it's called. The only heat generated by the resistor say if it's this circuit, is the real power. You've got the real and apparent. So the re real power, uh, this goes back to previous stuff, I, I squared R, two amps times 75 ohms, 300 watts. 
300 watts divided by 500 VA gives us a power factor of 0.6. This just helps illustrate what's going on here, and it's all due to the uh, phase angles and the reactive components. You won't have to reproduce this in a pool question. Just giving you some background. Now, some of this is going to become important. Power factor can be calculated using the phase angle between the current and voltage. And of course, we've done that multiple times this evening. And this is the one and only time that you're going to use a trig function on our calculator, and it is extremely easy. So don't let that be scary. So power factor equals the cosine of the phase angle, or the symbol theta, as, it, as it's shown here. Power factor is going to be 1 when the phase angle is 0. All apparent power is real power. So in this case, we'd be dealing with a, um, a resistor or a circuit that where the capacitive and inductive reactants cancel. Power factor is going to be 0 when uh, theta is 90 degrees. That would be like putting uh, AC current across an inductor or a capacitor with nothing else in the circuit. So for a phase angle of 30 degrees, what is the power factor? Well, let's see if we can calculate that. So it's going to be cosine 30. We'll go over to the calculator cam. Turn it on. Clear it. And the cosine key we haven't used yet. That's right here. You can see that's a multi-tap key. We want the first one cosine. And what was the value that they gave us? It was um, 30 degrees. Okay, cosine 30. And you'd normally think you'd have to put in the right paren, but if you don't, the calculator assumes that. I'm going to press enter. And here's another totally useless answer, square root of 3 over 2. So our answer toggle is going to come up to 866 times 10 to the minus third. So you move it three places, you get 0.86. I think we'll get that if we press answer toggle again. Yeah, 0.886. So if we come back to the presentation. So cosine of 30 is 0.866. So the power factor is 0.866. So for a phase angle of 30 degrees, what is the power factor? Cosine angle. Like I said, this, these are extremely easy. And we're right to pool questions. What happens to reactive power in an AC circuit that has both ideal inductors and ideal capacitors? Probably. Probably. Yep, it's repeatedly exchanged between the associated magnetic and electric fields, but is not dissipated. How, <clears throat> how can true power be determined in an AC circuit where the voltage and current are out of phase. Don't you think about that. So they're asking for true power. And we're going to know it is A. Now the apparent power, uh, we don't know what, uh, what, what, what's in the circuit, but we do know how many volts and how many amps are involved. Uh, and if we know the power factor, then we can, dish that, that is the true power. So if it was 1,000 watts VA. How about the do uh, delta there? Could that be an answer? No, um, because we, we don't ever do anything with the reactive power. We just use apparent power which is the VA, not to be confused with the Veterans Administration. Yep, actually, there, there really isn't any such thing as reactive power because inductors and capacitors do not consume any. That, remember, it's a wattless power. So that would be another way of uh, eliminating D. What is the power factor of an RL circuit having a 60 degree phase angle between voltage and current. Well, we know it's going to be between 0 and 1. That will immediately eliminate A and D. And what are we going to do here? Charlie. Charlie. 
Charlie, and that's cosine of uh, 60 degrees. Let me do that on the calculator over here. Cosine 60, enter, 1 half, or 0.5. 500 e minus 3 or 0.5. Correct. How many watts are consumed in a circuit having a power factor of 0.2 if the input is 100 volts AC at 4 amps? Well, how would we approach this one? 4 amps times 100 times 0.2? Yes. Baker. Yep. It's 4 times 100 times yes. point 0.2. Exactly. So the VA voltage times the, the VA number is 400. Power factor is 2. So to 400 times 0 0.2, 80 watts. Yes. So they, they make you think a little bit, but, but these are really easy. How many watts are consumed in a circuit consisting of a 100 ohm resistor in series with a 100 ohm inductive reactance drawing 1 ampere? Some tricky words here. Okay. All right, do you see how we got that? Uh, the inductor is not going to be consuming any watts, but we know that there's um, 100 ohms and uh, one ampere, so I squared R is 100. The inductor doesn't exist. What is reactive power? Alpha. 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 Wattless, non-productive power. What is the power factor of a circuit having a 45 degree phase angle between voltage and current? What's cosine 45? Delta. Yep. 707 Calculator cam. Clear. Delta. Cosine 45. Enter. Square root of 2 over 2. We saw that before. Yeah. 0.707. Just delta. Correct. So these, these might sound hard, but they're not. What is the power factor of an RL circuit? Doesn't matter if it's RL or RC, having a 30 degree phase angle between voltage and current. So what's the cosine of 30? 0.80. Charlie. Yep, Charlie, 0 0.866. How many watts are consumed in the circuit? See, there's a whole bunch of pool questions here uh, for just a couple of principles. How many watts are consumed in a circuit having a power factor of 0.6 if the input is 200 VAC at 5 amps? Delta. Delta, Delta. 600, right? The VA five is going to be... 200 times 0.6. Yeah, five, the VA is 5 times 200, which is 1,000, times 0.6, 600 watts. Here's another one. Man, there's a lot of these. How many watts are consumed in a circuit having a power factor of 0.71 if the apparent power is 500 VA? Oh, they make making us work this one backwards a little bit. B, bravo. Bravo. Bravo, yep. They're giving us the 500 VA. The power, oh, I guess it's not really uh, backwards. I thought they were making it, yeah, okay. But that's right. 500 times 0.71, correct. Guess what? That's the end of chapter four, part one. <laughs> Did you all survive that <laughs> somewhat? Some of, some of you may, may need to go back over some of this uh, to get it, um, especially those that wanted to get a, or want to get a 100% on, on your exam. Uh, you'll want to be sure that you can do all of these. We've covered about half the pool questions in chapter four. We'll get the other half next week. We're going to get into resonant circuits and some other um, various and exciting things that are all related to electronics. All right, so this is our, what do we call this, class chat time. So uh, Gary and I will both pop in here, and you can ask about the weather in South Carolina. You can ask <laughs> about anything in this chapter, anything we've talked about, um, ham radio question, how long do I need to make my antenna? It's, it's uh, op open forum here for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, or as long as people have questions or comments. I'm looking hey, for- Dave, I thought uh, at one time, uh, I think last year, 
there was something about uh, the power factor or something. It was always the uh, larger number divided by the uh, smaller number, or vice versa. Well, there are some. There are some. Um questions, and I know there were some in the general, uh, especially when they were dealing with the deviation ratios and uh, modulation indexes, um, uh, and op amps were, were another area where we were doing a bigger divided by smaller, but uh, okay. that, that, that didn't apply to power factor. But that, okay. that, rule of, that rule of thumb did apply to some things we've talked about in the past. All right. Anything Any else? Comments? I've enjoyed your little tips. How are we doing? Say again. I said I enjoyed your little tips. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we we want you to pass your exam. So we we work through understanding you know what they're looking for. We work through how to do it, and then uh, ultimately we we try to share some things. Uh, and a lot of these come from students, um, past students. So some of them we think of our, ourselves, but. You all are a lot smarter than, than we are. I, I had a question about the repetition to help us create that brick wall. Yeah. Repetition is being, um, which is how far does that go? So as we keep going on, there's more and more material uh, while we're spending, having a greater interval perhaps, are we still going back and continuing where we are at chapter six, going back over things in chapter three and how often? Yes, absolutely. Um, if, if you wait until the end of the series, um, 16 weeks I think in total, you will have forgotten anything that you learned in chapter two unless you're reviewing it. So, and, and the, the principle is uh, the refresh can be longer and longer. So uh, it's very good to go over the, the questions um, a day after you know, doing, doing the class and then three days, then five days, and, and you can kind of stretch it out. And you'll, you'll know if you're on track if you do the chapter review for that chapter and you, you get all of them or almost all of them right. So, yeah. That, so the earlier, if you're getting them right and the earlier material, you can space it out longer and longer over absolutely. time. Absolutely, yep. And yep. then if you start finding that you're getting things wrong, you can shrink that time frame as well, I guess. Absolutely, yep. And if you're a real glutton for punishment, you, you, can, uh, you can do multiple <laughs> chapters. <laughs> So we've been recommending just doing one right right after we teach it. It'll be a little bit hard this week because we've only covered half the material in chapter four. So if, if you jump in and, and do the online review for chapter four, there'll be some things you might have never heard of before. That wouldn't be a waste of time because the ones that you don't have any idea what to do about will plant a seed in your head that says, how am I gonna do that? So when we do cover it next week, um, hopefully, it'll be extra special. <laughs> in, other, in other words, because you've been pondering it, um, when you get the answer, you'll say, oh, that's how I do it. So that, that's Thank valuable you. too, even if, even if you don't know the answer. Okay, you have to ask Gary some questions. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no leave me alone. All right. It, are there any chapters that you're especially looking forward to? Antennas are always nice. Antennas are, are yeah, antenna, and the extra class material on antennas uh, goes significantly beyond what we covered in, in general. And in, antennas are going to be your very best friend in your ham radio career, so that, that will be a very worthwhile <coughs> uh, chapter for you practically. And prop propagation. How about one question as far as uh, an unrelated um, uh, study course question? Sure. Does anybody know anybody that can uh, uh, weld aluminum? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'll, got, I'll get with you, Steve. Yeah, you know, I've, I've got a son-in-law that's done it, done it some, and he just happens to be in our. That was Steve, huh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for someone to do the same thing. Yeah, my, my son-in-law, uh, Randy Betcher is his name, uh, and they live in Woodruff. He's not available a lot, but um, he, he claims that he can't really weld aluminum, but I've seen some of his work, and, it, and it's pretty good. I don't know how available he is, but we might be able to ho hook you up with a resource. Well, good, because I've acquired an aluminum crank-up that needs repair. Okay. 
Yeah, I don't know if Randy would be willing to take that on or not, but we, we could ask him, get an opinion anyway. Because, Steve, you only and live a possible structural question, too. Yeah. Uh, Gary, I don't know which one of you could answer this. Um, I got a little bit of a, a leg in that uh, tubing. It's a uh, triangular structure, mm -hmm. and I've got to replace a segment. Um, what I was thinking is, is if I could find the right OD to go in the ID of the tower, uh, you know, insert it yep. and fill in the gap, mm -hmm. is that structurally sound? Uh, you're ask, asking a mechanical engineering question that I wouldn't want to certify. <laughs> yeah. If it's something that is not, I mean, if, if it was at the bottom of the tower and you were putting up a massive beam, I'd, I'd really want an answer from somebody's, you know, somebody with structural e expertise. But if, if it's a lightweight <laughs> antenna on a not so tall tower, it, uh, you, you could uh, be a, you, you could be a bit more risky. You could bolt bolt okay. it and uh, bolt it and, and weld it perhaps. All right, one more. One last question for us. Gary's getting tired, so one more question. Well, I want to say we got him out early. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've never done this part of the class in this short a time period before. We did we didn't go through every calculation, but we we did cover um, it, at least one of every type. So that was good. Okay, well. We'll sign off then. Thank you all Thank for you. being with Have us tonight and paying mm -hmm. attention. And yep. uh, chapter four, part two, next week. Yep. Until then, 73, y'all. 73.